Hello friends and welcome back to the channel. This is MSFS Flight Plans. I'm Nick and I will be your pilot and your tour guide for today's journey. If you caught my post from earlier this week, then you'll know that I'm now on the tail end of suffering through COVID and I appreciate the condolences for the folks that sent them over to me, but uh, have no fear. I am a seasoned COVID veteran. This is now my third round of it. And uh, those of you that have had it, which I imagine most of you know that it's pretty awful, but after wallowing in bed for three days, I came to the realization that this world is not going to explore itself and we need to get out there and do it. So I'm sucking it up and I'm going to go ahead and make this flight. And it's going to be a pretty short flight because I'm still not feeling totally great. And if you hear what sound like any unusually long pauses, it's because I'm sparing you the misery of listening to me hack and sniffle into the microphone. I know I mentioned on that last flight that I was heading back over to the States, but after I stopped recording that one, I did another flyover of the town, checked out some more spots in Indonesia on the satellite map, and I found one more place that I feel like we just have to check out. And since I love volcanoes, and there's plenty of them here, and since you know that I love history, and since I love the most historic events in history, we're going to take a look at the site of the most violent, destructive, and deadly volcanic eruption in all of recorded human history, and that is, of course, Mount Tambora which actually isn't very far at all from our last Indonesian flight, just about 250 miles to the east of that. And this is going to be a short hop flight because there's no airports close to this location. And these are just designed to kind of show you what's down there and you can decide what airports you want to come from. But when we get the flight plan, you'll see I've designated the two closest airports in the plan. If you want to download it, you can fly it if you just want to take your time. Or you can alter it in little nav map if you want to. And if you don't know how to do that, I have another video that shows how to alter your little nav map plans. Uh, so you can enjoy that longer flight if you'd like to, but it won't let you create a flight plan in Little Nav Map, which can be you know hooked up to a link that you guys can download. So I've designated two spots, but you won't be able to set it up exactly like we're flying it today. I started in the air, landed, which is why my flaps are still down. We're going to take off smack dab in the middle of a volcanic lake in the middle of a volcanic island known as Satonda Island. And we're going to take off and fly directly to Mount Tambora, which will be east of here, circle around it, and then I'm going to land in the Mount Tambora crater, which should be awesome. And if you look at the crater on Google Maps and even in Little Nav Map, and maybe even in the sim, although I didn't check it out, it looks like there's a tiny little lake in the middle of it. Actually, it's off to the side. But in the sim, the lake is pretty much the whole floor of the crater, so I don't think we're going to have a problem. And once again, I'm flying in the Blackbird Simulations version of the PC-6 Porter, which the last time we flew this was out at Machu Picchu. And in my opinion, this is the far superior version to the stock version. Again, this is the Blackbird version. And I chose it because it is a STOL aircraft, which I think we're probably going to need to get up and down in these little lakes. And what I'm going to do is hop in. That's the lowest rim of this crater. And you'll see we'll fly all the way around it once, but I don't think I'll be able to get up over any other rim. <laughs> so I landed coming over that, then came in here and turned around. And we're going to try to fly right over that. So let's hop in and do it. Get this boy fired up. And you can see I'm flying solo today. The person that was with me in that Machu Picchu flight, for reasons you'll now understand if you've watched some of our other videos, is not my favorite co-pilot, so she stayed at home today. And this thing's going to start moving as soon as we get going, so I need to be ready to just rock it. Rock it and roll. We've already got full flaps out. Alright, shut that off and we'll start turning right now. And then we'll just, once we get turned, I'm going to give it full throttle and we're going to rock. Full RPM. Most of the scenery here looks amazing, like our other Indonesia flight. And this thing, if you were to just give it full throttle like this, would be hard if we were on wheels because of the torque of the engine but it's not so bad when you're on the floats. Yep, we made it, no problem, cool. You can see if those trees were there, we'd have some stretching, but luckily there's lots of trees here. All right, I'm getting some warnings that we're going way over the top, so we'll kick that back a little bit. Get our warnings extinguished. And we're gonna need some altitude, so we'll do that while we're circling this island. All right, let's try not to blow up the engine here. And if this was real to life, I probably would have already blown up the engine because as you can see, when you decrease the throttle, it makes it jump a little bit there, with the torque. So there's Tambor. We're going to come back around and take a look at that, of course. All right, are our flaps all the way up? Yep, we're good. 
This will be completely hand flown today since we're not following the flight plan. So there's Satanda. And the only dating I get, info I could get about that place is that it's quote unquote thousands of years old, which of course is very ambiguous. But it's supposedly older than Mount Tambora, and I believe it's also dormant. And if you were to dive down in that lake there, which isn't as salty as the ocean, they say it's brackish, you would discover two nested craters, which is one inside of another one, one at around 130 feet deep, and the other at 226 feet which would actually be pretty deep for an unassisted dive. But as you can see, it looks really cool. The unusually high alkalinity level of the lake water causes a supersaturation of calcium carbonate, and that is fertile ground for the cyanobacteria that build stromatolites along the shorelines, and if you don't know what those are, you should take a look at them. They're kind of strange-looking structures that look kind of like little melting pedestals all gathered around each other. And scientists have dated those at at least 10,000 years old, which gives us some idea about the last time this volcano was active, unless they survived the last eruption. So if it's older than 10,000 years, if you watch the Guatemala video, which you should if you're into volcanoes, that would mean that it's older than a Holocene volcano, because Holocene is the current geological epoch. And that looks really nice. And as you can see, there's virtually no structures on this island. Although you might be able to see when we come around the side. There's a little dock on the southwest, which is that little lip that we flew over. And an even smaller dock, which you can barely see under that pontoon right there. North of that, inside the crater. But apparently just on the external side, or the ocean side, they've got some pretty nice looking coral reefs if you're into diving. You feel like coming all the way out here just to dive in a nice looking coral reef. But of course, while you're here, you can check out Mount Tambora. Alright, we need a lot of altitude, so we're going to keep coming up. Get it trimmed. And you can see there's all kinds of little towns and stuff over on the mainland when we get over there, but this, this island is uninhabited. But when looking at some of the little tourism sites, they said there's a little walking trail that goes all the way around it, and sometimes people will come over here from their trip to Mount Tambora and just take a little nice scenic walk around here. I wouldn't mind going just to see the stromatolites. I don't know how many places in the world you can actually spot those. So there's the big boy right there. And you know what? I didn't look to see, because I couldn't really, you know, you can't see elevation very well on the satellite map. I don't know what that crater is right there. You better believe I'll go check that out. The one off the nose there, once we're done with this flight. There's a river that looks okay. You know, sometimes when rivers go downhill, they don't look great in the sim. And that one just looks okay. But I did take a little flight, a lower altitude flight over this town here, which looked pretty good before I came in for a landing. And just a heads up, if you're going to start in the air like I did, be sure to reset your altitude. It started me at 12,000 feet, which took me about... 10 minutes just to get <laughs> low enough to land in that crater. All right, I'm going to give it some more throttle to try to try not to redline, but we have got to get higher, as you can see. We can always do a lap if we need to. So getting to Tambora, and man, that thing, if you look at sea level and see how high that rises, you can get a sense of how big that is. But wait, that's not all. Before the 1815 eruption, which was the big one, and I'll tell you all about that in a minute, this stratovolcano was more than 14,000 feet high. And to frame that a little, Mount Samiru, which is the one, the tallest one we saw in that last Indonesia flight, was only at 12,000. Only at 12,000. But when this thing was in its full glory, it was higher than that. And now it's just over 9,300 feet, so imagine adding almost another mile on top of what we see here. That would have been imposing. And as you can see from the turbulence, I do have the live weather on, but it's a beautiful day, so why not? So if this thing's 9,300 feet high now, and we're at 3,400 feet, you can see we've got a ways to go. That's fine, we'll circle around. While we're doing that, we'll look at the scenery. Looks pretty nice. And I said in that last video that I was going to go back and fly over the towns around that airport and they look just as good as I imagined they would, so 
you can go out and have some fun on that flight if you want to look at more than just the volcanoes. It looks real nice. Alright, I think that's about as much juice as I can give this without stalling, so we'll just have to take our dear sweet time with it as we climb away. But the 1815 eruption of this thing currently stands as the largest and deadliest in recorded human history, as I mentioned at the beginning. And it scored a 7 on the VEI scale. And again, if you don't know what that is, please go check out that Guatemala video, because it's such an amazing flight. It's jam-packed with volcanic information. But if you don't feel like doing that right this very moment, the VEI scale is based on the volume of material that's ejected in the atmosphere and the ash cloud height and some other subjective criteria. And it's not precise, but used more for comparison purposes between one eruption and another. But it's also a logarithmic scale, which means each successive level is ten times more powerful than the last one. And as I've continued my exploration of volcanoes, I've discovered that Contrary to what I mentioned in both of the videos, Mount Vesuvius and Mount St. Helens appear to have been rated a 5 on the VEI, not a 4, which is what I had stated earlier. Which means this one would have been a hundred times more powerful than those. Ejecting anywhere from 10 to 30 cubic miles of material into the atmosphere. And it's estimated the ash cloud from that thing could have reached 26 miles into the atmosphere, which is really, really high. Outside of going that high, a high level for the mushroom cloud coming out of these would have been considered 9 or 10 miles, so this would be more than twice that high. Not as high as the very highest clouds, though. Of course, I had to check that out as well. And speaking of having to correct myself, someone had uh, sent an email to me as to not humiliate me publicly, which I appreciate. And by the way, if you ever want to send me an email, I did set up an account for our channel here. And that is msfsflightplans at gmail.com. And the person was asking, I don't think they were being jerks about it, but they just asked if I had any references for the information I was giving. <laughs> and I said, yeah, the internet. Which is always risky business, because the more and more I've researched and then getting feedback from people who probably know better than the internet, because most of them that were correcting me actually live in these regions. I've discovered that this ain't the Encyclopedia Britannica. Everybody trusted the Encyclopedia Britannica back in the day. But nowadays, unless you're witnessing it with your own eyes, it's hard to know what's true and what's not. And even trying to find the information about this, even on you know the official pages for these areas, I was getting conflicting information. So, all that is to say, don't use these videos to study for your history or geology exams. because. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can, and what I usually do is just try to kind of find the average consensus, consensus when I'm looking at this information. And if I can see things that corroborate across a number of different sites, that's usually what I go with. And I don't mind being corrected. In fact, I welcome it. If you do have more accurate or more expansive information that can add some color and context to these flights, drop it in the comments. Let us know what's up. We want to get it as close to the action as we can. Our reporters on the ground, that's all you guys. So this explosion, the one in 1815, was heard up to 1,200 miles away. Which sounds far until you consider the Krakatoa eruption, which I mentioned in the last video. In 1883, that one happened. Boy, these guys have really been pummeled out here, haven't they? And that Krakatoa sound was heard over 10% of the Earth's surface. And there's actually a cool YouTube video I found about that. Which, if I can find it again, maybe I'll put it in the description for this, because it was neat. Talked about not just that, but all the biggest eruptions. But I had to do the math on that, what half of 10% would be, because I figured it would be the radius out from there, and once I did the math, old Cracky only beat this one out by just a little bit, by about 50 miles, which is close enough to probably be within the margin of error, so this one may have been just as loud, if not louder. But in that video, which I hope I can find for you guys, they said if you were standing within, I don't know, I think three miles of it, it would have been 310 decibels, which is also logarithmic. And it would have instantly blown your eardrums completely out and rendered you perfectly, uh, permanently, perfectly and permanently deaf. 
assuming you could actually survive being that close to it. The death toll from this eruption is also the subject of a good bit of speculation, considering it was over 200 years ago, and again, the internet. But it appears the local carnage could have been as high as 13,000 people. However, the real damage was caused by the climate impact, which led to widespread crop failures over the next year, earning 1816 the name The Year Without a Summer. The current estimates put the number of additional deaths caused by starvation from all the crop failures at around 100,000, but it could be much higher than that. And frankly, I don't even know how they came up with that number, considering how little of the world had even been explored by people who would track that sort of thing back then. But there were reports of a lingering dry fog that lasted throughout 1815 in the United States. And even more recently, I think there was a big Icelandic eruption several years ago. And I remember here in the States, we had some pretty spectacular sunsets from all the ash clouds hanging in the air. But they said that uh, dry fog was so thick that even over in the western United States, which would have been the closest to this area, that people could look straight at the sun with their naked eye and see sunspots on it. And it's a bit of a public service announcement. If you've never tried to search for sunspots with your naked eye, I'll encourage you not to try that. Back when I was even more into astronomy than I am now, I had a big telescope, which I think I also mentioned in previous videos. And I got a filter that you could put on the end of it if you wanted to do solar observations. And if you held it up to any normal light, it would look like it was completely opaque. You couldn't see through it at all. But once you put that thing on the end of the telescope, you could actually stare right at the sun and then magnify it with the eyepieces of the telescope. And man, was that cool. And if you have a smaller scope, I think you can order them. They're not really all that cheap if you're going to just look at the sun once or twice. Probably be a little more expensive than I'd want to pay for it, but if you've never seen the sun through a telescope with your naked eye, that's pretty cool. And don't ever, ever try to <laughs> look at it without a filter on it or you will immediately burn your eyeball out. And on that note, since I mentioned uh, during that meteorite impact flight in Australia looking at the moon, I'll also discourage you from looking at the full moon through a telescope because that can also damage your eyes. That looks wonderful. Look at that. Absolutely beautiful. This is a massive volcano. Massive. And when you see the size of this crater, and when you consider that it blew a mile of earth off the top of it, you know that was a big, big blast. Now that we're getting higher and it's getting harder to climb, we're going to have to just do a kind of low, slow lap around this to get the rest of the altitude that we're going to need. And though Mount Tambora is still considered an active volcano, nothing terribly serious has happened in the last 50 years. I think 1967 was the last eruption of any significance, although it's had some rumblings in the 20-teens. Even the 1967 one was pretty tame. I think it scored a zero on the VEI scale. And today, as you can imagine, it's a popular tourist destination with hikers and sightseers. However, as I was looking at reports from the visitors, it appears that all of Indonesia is suffering from a bit of a plastic waste crisis. As much of its exposed landscape and the beaches are being overwhelmed with both local garbage and stuff washing up on the shores from around the world. And you can see some pictures of that. I mean, the beaches are, some of them, are completely covered with plastic bottles, which is kind of depressing. In 2021, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry here reported that the volume of plastic waste alone in the country reached 1.6 million tons. And due to poor waste management, as happens in a lot of the underdeveloped countries, they said that up to 83 of that stuff winds up in the 83% of that winds up in the ocean, which is a depressingly significant portion. And I've heard from people that sail on transport ships and things like that, that there's actually islands of trash floating around in the South Pacific. Big islands. So to combat that, the government is attempting to achieve zero plastic waste by 2040, which seems awfully ambitious, but if they can pull it off, that would certainly be a great template for the rest of the world to follow. All right, we've made it up over the edge here, just barely. So we'll do a circle around and then we'll come in for a landing, see if we can do it. 
that will require a little bit of finessing because it's a pretty steep embankment there as you can see but I have confidence in us I'll let you guys man the flaps I'll try to control the throttle we'll see if we can do it you know I bet this would probably be cool although it wouldn't make a good flight for these type of videos to fly over at like 20,000 feet or higher although you really get the, the details and all that when you're down here close like that Look at that, there's some good detailing on the rim there. There's not any stretching. They've actually got all the little rivulets from the water and mud running down the side. Really nice. The interior looks pretty good with the exception of that far shoreline. But again, on the satellite maps, that lake there is probably less than a quarter of the size that it appears here in the sim. And it looks like it might actually be bigger than the one we took off from, which should make it easy to land in it. The problem is going to be getting turned around. All right, let me think about how I want to do this. I need to find the longest stretch of it. All right, well, this will be fun. Look at the size of that thing. Good grief. Oof. Let's see what's down on this side. Yeah, this is just a beautiful area to fly all around. All of it looks fantastic. All right, what do you guys think? I think we may be coming down over here, maybe the largest strip link that we've got. So let's try cutting the throttle, coming down low over this lip. We're already at flap speed, so we'll get those down. I'd say we take a lap around it, but it'll take another 30 minutes just to get around this thing. All right, we got full flaps. Oh, there's a that's a pretty long distance there. Okay, so let me see. <laughs> Oh, this is going to be tough, but fun. Very fun. And that's what matters. Look at that little washout basin down there. Oh, the details are stunning. Very nicely done. Beautiful. A little bit of stretching on the other side, but that looks just great. All right, well, looks like it's going to be a shallower approach over here. I'm getting some ghosting there on my pillar, you can see. I do have the graphics turned up pretty high, though, since I'm using a steam gauge cockpit. And I'm going to lose sight of it. Oh, man. All right, so I guess I'm going to try coming around, and there's some popping, too. Well, that looks, that looks terrible. All right, well, good. We'll get over here and then get that behind us, so all we'll see is the good stuff on the other side. But just above where the stretching is there, again, look, the details... Maybe they figured no one's going to be stupid enough to try to land in this like we're doing. But yeah, I'm definitely stupid enough to try it. Maybe going to dial the RPMs back some, see how slow we can get going here. I want to be just above stall speed once I take that turn. See, if you didn't see the shoreline where those cliffs are, that would look amazing. And it does. I think we'll be good. If we can get down to like 60 knots or so, we'll be fine. The question is, can I get down there? So gosh, I wonder how high those ledges are from the top of the water here. Well, once you get close, it looks good again. It's just going to pop a little on us, but once you get right up on it, it's not too bad. Don't let that discourage you from this flight. If nothing else, this landing challenge alone is probably worth it. All right, how close can I get to that edge there while still going down? Yeah, we're above flap speed now. I shouldn't be doing this. Come on, wings, stay connected. All right, see if we can take a safe turn here. Well, we were so high above it, I think this lake's probably way bigger than I was estimating. Yeah, we're going to be good. Maybe. I have no idea how high we are, because I don't know how high above sea level this thing is. Alright, we'll, we'll aim for that far little mud flow there. And then just shut the engines off once we get down. I've got the throttle at idle. And if we have to, we can just turn around again, which I think we may have to. 
Unless I try to plow into that wall over there. Yeah, I think we're going to have to. Alright, so I've got a little bit of lower terrain there. I'm going to try to sweep over that and then do a little pass again. Because we're pretty low right now. And I think I'll have room to turn around. <laughs> yeah, do not try this in real life. Definitely try it in the sim. Alright, I'm getting down to stall speed now. Wow, we must have been much higher than I thought because there was there was some room there. All right, here we go, second pass. Look at that though. Mmm, it's worth it alone for that view. There's a little stretching there on the right, to the right of the nose. That looks good. I love watch. I love seeing how they did those mud flows. Come on, baby, stay airborne. That looks unnatural. All right. Yeah, we'll be good this way. I hope. All right, let's try this again. Yeah, we got plenty of room now. Plenty. I'm just gonna go ahead and cut the condition back to idle too. Because if we can't do it this time, we're not doing it. So stick around for just a minute if you want to see the full flight plan, which will show you where those airports are, and then we'll take a look at this on the satellite image as well. And we're down. Get a little nice volcanic air in here. Well, sorry to have to end you with that scene, with that cliff there, which doesn't look great, but who cares? Awesome flight. All right. So here's where we are in relation to that last flight, if you're wondering just how close we were. Here's the airport we took off from there, came up over these volcanoes here, landed there. If you haven't done that flight yet, it's absolutely awesome. You should check it out. And again, uh, Krakatoa was right over here, if you want to go check that out. But here's where the nearest airports are. Not close at all. I'm not sure what the distance is there. I think it was like 40 miles. And then here's the other one, which is probably 50 or 60 miles. Pretty far away. So I started in the air here, and you can see the ridiculous loop I had to make to try to <laughs> come in for landing on that. So don't start at 12,000 feet if you can adjust that. But this distance is, I don't know, probably 10 miles over here. So it wasn't too bad, but you're going to have to be climbing a lot during that flight. And let's get in a little bit closer to here to where we took off from. So here's that little dock on the ocean side of this. And there's that little dock on the inland side over there. Maybe that's not a dock. Maybe it's just little rocks. You'd think they put a little dock in there for boating or something, but now I don't see it. And that must be the walking trail that goes around it. You can just barely see it there. On Google Images, you can see there's a dock that sticks out probably about that far for boats, but you can't see it here. And here's Tambora. And as you can see, actually in here there's no lake at all, but in Google Maps right here, there's a little tiny lake. But I guess we got lucky. It must be the rainy season in the sim because we got a nice big area to come into. And that's it, guys. Look at the size of that hole, though. Wow. So I'm guessing that most of the elevation was similar to where it is now, which means that last mile, roughly, that got blown off the top must have been incredibly steep. Boy, I bet that was really something to look at. So that's it, guys. Again, this full flight plan, plan will be in the description if you want to load it up. But what I'd probably recommend you do, unless you just want to take that flight, which is probably quite nice, is just start in the air somewhere around here. Start low. Land and take. Heck, you could start right above this crater if you wanted to, if that's just all you wanted to see. But that was a pretty neat looking island, too, so it might be worth checking that as well. I bet it'd be neat to do it like sunset, too, where you can see it. Kind of maybe add some clouds covering parts of the top there. But anyway... Thanks for joining me, guys. It was an awesome flight. Once I get back to full speed, I'll do another full-length flight. I'm, I'm planning at this point to hit Chicago next. So we'll probably take off north of Chicago. I got a nice add-on pack for that, and we'll go check that out, look at some sites down along the way, and head back to the good old US of A for a little while. It's been a blast, guys. Can't wait to see you again. Later.